Welcome to another edition of We Need to Talk About Movies. Brought to you by Banterflix.com. And now, here's your host, Jim McLean. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, I am indeed your host, Jim McLean, the editor-in-chief of the Bandaflix Movie Review website. Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast, We Need to Talk About Movies. This is the second of three festively-themed episodes of the pod. You might have already heard Joe and Therese's special edition of Crime Scene to Screen as they discussed on Frozen Ground. And you have the Bandaflix tradition that is the Christmas TV listings episode to look forward to still. But this is our festively themed episode of We Need to Talk About Disney. We are taking a break from the House of Mouse's dark era and we're venturing to 1997 as we take a look at Beauty and the Beast, Enchanted Christmas. Now, you're going to hear all this in my introduction because someone who shall remain nameless, well, okay, let's be honest, it was me, might have forgot to put down a little infill track for a clip of the film, so I'm having to record this now just for that reason. On this episode, I'm going to be joined by my co-host, Victoria Brown, the Banterflix resident Disney queen. This is, after all, her idea, so she is my co-host in this, and uh, I'm also joined by local writer Maria McQuillan. It's a lot of fun, as usual, there's a lot of transgressions, that's kind of what we do, particularly when I'm allowed to host... We go off on little tangents and rambles, so uh, if you enjoy them, great. If you don't, I apologise. If this is your first time listening to the pod, then I hope you enjoy the experience and you'll be tempted to venture back throughout our back catalogue. If, however, you've been listening to us for a while, then why don't you leave us a lovely review wherever you get your podcasting fix because that helps attract new listeners to the pod and that makes it all more worthwhile. I don't really know how or why. It's all to do with the algorithm. Nobody really knows. But yeah, if you'd leave us a lovely review wherever you get your podcast and fix, that would really help. So that's enough of me rambling on. Let's get stuck into this pod. And before we hear my chat with Maria and Victoria, let's play a clip of Beauty and the Beast Enchanted Christmas. presence your highness please accept this humble gift as a token of our appreciation i know i speak for everyone when oh just give it to me a storybook you call this a present i hope you have something better for me forte yes sir um of course master what is that a small piece in your honor, Master. Ugh, I hate it. Forte, that stuff is gloomy. Who disturbs my Christmas? Please, take this rose in exchange for shelter from the bitter cold. <laughs> I don't need a rose. Go away, you wretched old hag. been deceived by your own cold heart. A curse upon your house and all within it. Until you have found one to love you as you are, you shall remain forever a beast. Hello, I'm your host Jim McLean. Welcome to another episode of We Need to Talk About Movies as we continue our festive celebration as we get in the mood for Christmas with a very Christmassy themed edition of We Need to Talk About Disney. Now we're breaking away from the dark era of Disney, I do believe, and uh, my lovely counterpart on this podcast, Victoria Brown. I'm going to make you co-host in this, Brown, because this is, as I always say, this is your idea. This is the thing that you pitched to me nearly 12 months ago, maybe slightly longer ago, and we decided to look back at the dark era of Disney. But we're breaking away 
from that year. We're going to more recent times. We are going to, I believe, 1997? Yes. We're going to 1997 with Beauty and the Beast, The Enchanted Christmas. Victoria Brown, do you want to tell our listeners a little bit about this animation and why you've picked it for this special edition of the pod? Okay, well... Like Jim said, Beauty and the Beast and the Enchanted Christmas was released in 1997. So that's five years, five years, six years after the first film. Um, It takes place just after the Beast saves Belle in the original movie. So it's when she's still a prisoner, when the prince is still a beast. It's it's one that me and my sisters had on VHS. I don't know how we got a hold of it, but we watched it every year. And I think that was my first introduction to Tim Curry, pre-Rocky Horror. And I just remembered how cool his voice was. I was torn between picking this and Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas because, again, we would watch that a lot and it's it's my friend Becca's favourite Disney Christmas film, but I thought this would be an interesting one because I don't think a lot of people would have seen it, so this might encourage people to go have a wee nosy. Okay, well, it is available on Disney Plus or if, like, Double O Brown, if you have a copy of it on DVD knocking about, maybe VHS... I doubt this is available on Blu-ray, but possibly it might be available in Blu-ray as a double pack with the Beauty and the Beast. But uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about that. So that is the film we're talking about, this festive edition of We Need to Talk About Disney. Now, it's not going to be just Victoria and I discussing this because we are joined by local writer Maria McQuillan. Hi, Maria. Hello. So, Maria, had you watched this before? Were you like Brown growing up and this was a big part of your childhood or is this a first time viewing for you? Like me, I should say at this point, this is my first time that I'm aware of watching this. I think for me, it is the first time that I'm aware of watching it. Like, I feel like I did watch it when I was a kid, like very, very little. But like the one that we endlessly watched was Beauty and the Beast, the actual you know, the introduction to the series, you know. Um and I also, a couple of years ago, watched Lindsay Ellis's video on it, um, Nostalgia Chick, but she was known then. And I mean, I if you if you want a really good introduction to this film, it is a good introduction to it, to be fair, but it also rips it to shreds, so you know. Okay. Okay, well don't don't tune off this podcast right now. You can watch that <laughs> you can watch you can watch that later. Absolutely. So wait to see what we think of this and then kind of go off and seek out that video so i i was never a massive fan of beauty and the beast and i don't know why i mean it's a weird one and i know i'm straight away digressing because that's what we do (laughs) and but we're sticking with disney i would say i came back to beauty and the beast through the live action remake because i have a bit of a man crushing dan stevens and i think like the the added number the, the song that is in the live action version of Beauty and the Beast that's not in the animated version, I adore. I, I actually will admit at this point, I have that every often, every so often coming up on my iTunes playlist. It's, what can I say? I'm just a, a guy with a lot of heart. So I'm just a bit like the Beast. I'm a man with a lot of heart. But uh, yeah, I, I came back to Beauty and the Beast and revisited it. And I've kind of, I can see why so many people are massive fans but i know my lovely wife is a huge fan of beauty and the beast i think she has at least two or three copies she's i don't know if it's behind me i know this is an audio medium so you can't see it but somewhere lurking around this house actually it's just off camera here is a huge big like gigantic box that contains like an animated book or the illustrated book and the dvd and she's i think she's about three or four copies of it so she's a massive fan of the Beauty and the Beast. So I'll say later on, because she had never seen this um, before we watched it last night for this. But Brian, this was a part of your childhood. So do you want to get the ball rolling and say kind of your thoughts, your thoughts from revisiting it specifically for this pod, or I suppose looking at it back with those rose tinted glasses, because clearly it was something you have a lot of love for. It's a weird one. It's It's one I remember having a lot of love for, but... Watching it back this time, I'm kind of like, why did I like it so much? I think, like, unlike yourself, Jim, like, we watched Beauty and the Beast a lot. It, like, we did have a lot of Disney VHSs, but they were split between my mom's house and my nana's house. And my nana had, like, five or six of them, and Beauty and the Beast was one of the ones at her house. So your so, nana had the good stuff? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. 
yeah. whenever we went to her house we would watch Beauty and the Beast and a lot of people because Belle's a reader a lot of people assume that I love Beauty and the Beast because Belle reads but it's it's not in my top 10 I, I do love the film but not as much as you would think and then it, like I said we we watch this probably most Christmases because it does have that nice Christmassy it is very Christmassy feeling it's not like it's a Christmas story it's not just Beauty and the Beast it happens to be at Christmas time like Christmas is an important part of the very slim plot that yeah it's, 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 it's not like Die Hard it's not like Die Hard where people can have that argument whether or not it's a Christmas movie we all know yeah. Die Hard is a Christmas movie but you know <laughs> clearly this is a film that takes place not just at Christmas but Christmas is a key plot point towards it so therefore it passes the key test of it is a Christmas movie yeah definitely like it's the, the main the main crux of the plot is Belle wants to celebrate Christmas and the base isn't having any of it and obviously we're going to be a bit into spoiler territory here but we find out that the reason the base hates Christmas so much is because that's when the old lady came to the castle and asked for shelter and he turned her away that was on Christmas and that's when he got turned into a base and that's why he hates Christmas so much. Because, so, sorry to cut across you, Victoria, because I, watching this, I had assumed that it's because you can see the similarities between this and what you then see in the live action version. Now, I know it's not specifically Christmas. I think it's just a party mm-hmm. in Christmas. And then I had I was saying to my wife, because it has been a while since we've seen Beauty and the Beast, we were tempted to give it a watch after watching this. But I was like, is that not how, is the ver- how it opens in the live action? Is that not how it opens in the film? But I think she mentioned it's like kind of a stained glass window. And that's how you see the story come to life in the animation, the animated version. Sorry. Yeah. In the animated version, it opens, it's very like classic Disney. It opens with the castle and the music. And then it goes into like a stained glass kind of explanation, like a setup. But all it shows you is the prince and the old woman. Like, it doesn't show you anything going on in the castle before that. It doesn't show her interacting with him that much, really. Like, like in this version, we get them actually having dialogue with each other. Whereas you don't get that in the, in the original. And let's be honest, the Beast is a bit of a dick. He's awful in this. Yeah. I forgot how bloody bad it, he was. He's oh. a dick. Just say, I know it's a Disney pod, but he's, I know your mum might be listening. I know she'll be singing and this, that and the other, but you know, she'll be singing Christmas hymns and Christmas songs. Maybe not hymns. I don't know, but uh, she, she'll be listening and you know, you know, yeah, you can say the word dick, Brian. It's okay. It's okay. He's the beast. Thank you for the permission. <laughs> yeah. The beast is a dick. What can I say? So Maria, you've, you've watched this for the first time like me. I'm lukewarm about this. If I'm really honest, I think it's charming, but it didn't charm me. If I can, that's kind of my almost politician style answer. I found it charming. It didn't charm me. I think there's too many songs. And it's not that I don't like the songs. I think it's, I think it's an hour and 12 minutes and it could have very easily be a very effective 20, 25 minute short without some of the songs, not all of them. And we haven't even got to talking about Tim Curry yet, really. I know Brian has mentioned Tim Curry already, but what did you think of this? Like you were saying about the music, I was like, there are so few songs in this and I can't get over how much I hear each and every single one of them. Like, I I really, like, I watched this and was like, I'm so against this on so many levels. <laughs> I was not expecting this response. Like, I didn't, I, I didn't think you'd love it, but like, Oh my god! No, I was like, no, no. I, I, I wrote a list of things about the <laughs> film, and they're all negative. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, I, I, I just want to get straight into this list. So, so give us let let's yeah. start with so Good let's voice. start let's start with your the, the top negative for you. Um, hideous animation for Tim Curry. Yeah, it's it's weird. I mean, I noticed uh, this because you have. And I know in the past, when we've looked at the dark era, Victoria, we've talked about you can see quality dips in the animation. And I know, I think when we had you, Maria, on the Robin Hood episode, you kind of can see that creeping into some Disney big productions. 
this like the thing I would compare this to, and I know I've talked about this a lot on this pod at times, is is like Aladdin Two: The Return of Jafar. That level of animation, and when I was a a child, I never noticed that. I never noticed that. I never noticed because you just kind of like it's it's Aladdin. Let's go on another adventure, and I probably got used to watching the TV series as well, which probably was on a par with the uh, the animation quality. But I would agree with you. I think the animation, it looked from what you see on the big screen to then what you would see. It's kind of the level of animation you would see in Disney's TV shows at the time. And I don't know. I think you mentioned, Brian, you had this on, on VHS or DVD. Was this, uh, this? I don't think this was theatrically released. Theatrically released. Was this just a Disney TV channel thing or? Um, I'm it was straight to video. So you mentioned Return of Jafar there. That did very well sales wise. So once that was a big hit, they were like, oh, we can, because Disney, we can make some money off of this. So they opened an animation studio in Canada for like young animators to try and give them more like range to practice with. And then this was their next big project. So obviously they did have a lot smaller budgets than like the big theatrical releases, but. This was a studio that was specifically for up and coming animators to practice, and all their stuff would have been straight to video. And you, you both mentioned the Tim Curry thing there. I, I checked because the animation was driving me insane. I was like, what is wrong with this? Why does he look like that? It's really early CGI, and yeah. I don't understand why they did that. Like, <laughs> it would have been so much better hand drawn. It doesn't add anything. I, I don't gotta, get it. You've got to wonder maybe, was it? cheaper or quicker to quicker, render them maybe. through cgi because i think uh, am i gonna get this right because the beauty and the beast film is it the first hand-drawn or the, the first disney film to bring cgi the the the, the dance sequence the ballroom it, yeah the ballroom with it coming down because i i just remember at the time i'm old enough to remember these things i'm old enough this will joke will go over everyone's heads i'm old enough to remember the girl in the flake ads as we've noticed pre-recording but I I vividly remember a lot being made about that particular sequence because was, was Beauty, Beauty and the Beast was out before The Lion King, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, because there's that and then The Lion King, you can see that creeping in, isn't it? Um, the Cloud, I think, the, the Cloud of Simba's I dad so. um, is another CG. I think I could be wrong on that. That's, I'm not the Disney expert in this pod, but I I just wonder, would it be a case of possibly i don't know if it'd be cheaper but yeah as i've alluded to i think it it, it is quicker because it is really it is quite jarring because you're watching this kind of okay it's not a it's not up there with top ha- animation and hand-drawn etc or animation styles for disney but it is very kind of jarring when you're going between the two particularly when you have sequences where you have the beast or bell looking up at tim curry's character and it's this animation style, and then you have Tim Curry's character looking down, and it's a complete. It, it's a weird mix, and it's things like that. I don't know. Like, do do you remember noticing that, Brian, when you, you were younger? I remember, like, because obviously the organ's meant to be scary. It's meant to be creepy, and I remember that it creeped me out. I just didn't know what it was. I just knew it had this weird quality to it. So maybe that was part of the decision as to why they did that, because maybe they couldn't get across what they wanted in hand drawn but i i don't i don't know i don't think i noticed the specifics as a kid but i knew something was off yeah it's weird but you have you've already mentioned this you have tim curry who's just when is tim curry ever you know not given 110 percent, particularly when he's doing voice acting i mean he's he's fab in this you know with kind of he he is a a proper pantomime villain in this he want to boo and hiss I, I think if you dug a bit deep, I think his motivation is kind of weird <laughs> in that sense. But I, I get it. But I think when you look at what he's, his motivation for doing everything and X, Y, Z and preventing Beast from falling in love, I I, I kind of think it's a little bit weird, but I, I get it in that sense. But he's just happy being a big organ. But, you know, wouldn't wouldn't we all... So, so yeah, I, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you that negative, Maria. So that's a tick on that one. Is it going to be a tick from you? Yeah. Victoria? 
Okay. So what's the next one? What, what give us one we could maybe fight you with? <laughs> um. Well, I thought the music in it was awful. I don't it's think it's awful. <laughs> it's it's not incredible. But it's not awful. I I think what saves it, like the songs themselves, aren't great. I think it's the sequence, like the visual sequences that save it. So like. Tim Curry's big Don't Fall In Love song with the green little cherubs and all. I thought that was really cool. And uh, yeah. when Belle's talking about making a storybook for Beast as a Christmas present, when they kind of incorporate her and Chip into the book and make it look even more hand-drawn than it already is, I thought that was cool. But the actual song is, I don't know, it just lacks luster or something. Like, And they're not that catchy either. Yeah, they're not catchy. I just think... It's not that I didn't like them. It's just like there's another song to move the plot along a mm-hmm. little bit. Let's move the song. Like the one that I admit that kind of just didn't work for me is when they're going up to get the Christmas decorations and coming down. And it's just like, no, I can't remember what that Christmas that I can't remember what that song's called. They're going up to the tower and they're getting the decorations and they turn in, they bring all the bobbles and stuff down. And I, I my small niggle like i know everybody's meant to have been turned in this enchanted castle from something before and i get that what some of the characters are who were those people who got turned into the bubbles <laughs> right right i'm just i i know look i know brian that we have had these kind of weird discussions over the years not over the years over these the series of pods about kind of my weird things you know insert joke here why does a mouse need money why does the money need to be that size why does a horse want to be a cat xyz right who were those baubles before they got turned into baubles i don't know were they just footmen i don't know <laughs> seems like a it's, lot of footmen i don't know and why lot. and why and actually another thing as amber and i did comment for the size, okay, we'll come back to the Christmas tree. That was something that really annoyed me, right? But we'll come back to that. But for the Christmas tree sequence, there's nowhere near enough bubbles for that tree. I'm sorry. But I, I have seen my wife decorate our Christmas tree, and pretty much it's like 90% bubbles. Just, there's no green. You can just see bubbles and lights. There was only like about 20 bubbles in that. I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry. But no, back to my point. Um, I think there's just too many songs. It, it, the, the songs felt like they were just there to to pad everything out. And you could have probably took a few of those songs out, maybe give them a bit more work, and I think they'd have been more charming. Like, there's the, the song between Belle and Beast. Aren't they ice, ice skating? Is that, a, is that a song? Or that, that there's a song just after that that I find quite... I think there's one just after. Yeah, I find it quite sweet. But it's what you get a song and song. I mean, I'm... I'm just of the persuasion. It's like, okay, you have a song. You're like, okay, that's, it was a nice little song. And then it's like, right, two minutes later, oh, fuck, another song. All right, okay. <laughs> All right, another song. So I didn't hate the songs. I wasn't, I don't think I was down in them as much as you, Maria. I just think there was too many and they were there to pad everything out. So see, it's not a tick from me, Maria, for this one anyway. See, that was my problem was I was like, I'd forgotten the songs as soon as I've heard them. So mm-hmm. I have no, like, in my head, I was like, there were four songs in that film. And I have forgotten any other that were played. Like, so well, I think that was that was why I had such a strong reaction. I was like, this should be more memorable. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I'm as we're talking, I am looking back. Because I can't remember all the names of each <laughs> song. But I mean, I'm looking about when I say it like the song I do love in this that I think is genuinely sweet is As Long As There's Christmas, which I think is, I think, is that the one in the story? I think in the storybook, I think that's the one where they so. kind of, yeah. Uh, don't fall in love, which we've mentioned, and then yeah, as we get there's as long as there's Christmas reprise, it's like so we. Not only that, they pad it out, but they have to do the same song twice. Um, God. I don't remember a cut above the rest. I think that's the fire. Then down when they're doing the firewood, I think I don't know. God, I remember. And we also get as long as there's Christmas over the end title, so we get the same song three times. So it's never you, a good sign. <laughs> but yes, so so I I will fight you on that. The songs are terrible. I think the songs are okay. I just think there's too many, Maria. So it's not it's 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 good, 
but it's not right. So I'm not going to give you a tick for that one. I don't know. Is Brian going to give you a tick? No. No. That was the most indifferent no I've ever heard. <laughs> no, time. I'm I'm so torn because I, I do vividly remember Tim Curry's song. Like even I hadn't watched this in years and I remembered that song, but it's probably just because it's Tim Curry. Didn't the, remember oh, any of the other ones. I don't know if it's a Disney song or a Disney film that came after this or before this. It reminded me a lot, and I'm just, the visuals and the motif, it reminded, and I can't remember, it's a real Jim McLean half fact here, it's not even a half fact, because it reminded me of another sequence, possibly, I'm maybe going to say Jungle Book, in that sense, just with the eyes and kind of trying to enchant the beast with the the music, it reminded me of another, not so much song, but an animation sequence from another Disney film. I don't think it's Disney reusing animation like we've talked about in previous pods but there's other sequences possibly maybe uh maybe i'm just thinking of the hypnotism from jungle book or maybe i'm thinking of um the princess and the frog for some reason it, maybe it that's might, what i thought of it might be is it anastasia that's coming to mind because rasputin does this whole big he number in the underworld and he has like the green demons it's a very similar shade of green mm, that's true yeah i don't think i've ever seen anastasia so that's oh. a pod to come. <laughs> i was obsessed i i'm still obsessed okay i i've never seen it i've never seen it it's it's i go back to kind of uh the old darn side of gender roles and gender identity all that kind of stuff it's all the thing that that conservative politician was talking about because it had a girl in the lead when i was younger god forbid not interested not interested buddy give me aladdin every day we'll make we'll add that to our list because anastasia is great dimitri is just and rasputin is a great villain i think it's it's christopher lloyd uh from back Mm -hmm. to the future voices him like it's a but we'll circle back to this i always forget that I always forget, sorry, that girls have crushes on cartoon characters as much as kind of boys have crushes over Jessica Rabbit. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, that's all right. It's okay. It's all, we're all kind of equal footing on this podcast. <laughs> it's all about kind of breaking down those barriers. So, yes, we will get to Anastasia, I'm sure, at some point. It's just, it's it kind of missed me. Maybe I was just out of Disney stage at that time. At that time. But anyway. Let's get back to Beauty and the Beast. The Beauty and the Beast, the Enchanted Christmas. Maria, you've you've got one, you've got one tick. What are we going to go here? What's your next niggle? Let me see if I can whittle it down. Um... Oh, God. I, I hang on off the top <laughs> without showing us how long is this list because because I did say we were going to try and pod shorter than the actual film itself. But how long is this list? I have nine points. That's okay. You don't need to shorten yeah. them. Then we're, we've got two. You've got seven. We're, we're okay. <laughs> I feel like my list of like grievances is just this is my Martin Luther, you know, grievances <laughs> on the door here. <laughs> but are any of these grievances just really petty though? Well, I don't know if it's petty or if it's me having a gym moment, which okay. is the, like, why would a human want to remain furniture? Thank like, you. you yeah. Know, I, I, the whole way through it, I was like, why does Tim Curry want to remain stuck to a wall as an yep. organ? Like, it's-, it's never explained. And even when like his little sidekick, Fife, is looking out the window and he's like, oh, you should see them. They're falling in love. And he's like, oh, I should have a look. But I'm <laughs> bolted to the wall. But then why do you want to stay an organ if that clearly annoys you, though? Yeah, as I said earlier on, that was something that really niggled me. So I'm going to give you a tick for that because... I think as a villain, he's someone you want to boo and hiss. Mm. But looking at it now as a supposed adult, his motivation for doing things, his goal for doing things, it just doesn't make sense. There's no logic whatsoever. When I was doing a bit of research on this before the pod, because I was curious like if this was their, their intended plot, their next Beauty and the Beast kind of... Se- it was meant to be a sequel with Gaston's brother as the villain. And he was kind of like avenging his brother. That motivation, I understand. Staying in Oregon forever, I don't get whatsoever. Like, it's not even as if he's better, like a better organ player as the organ, because it does do a flashback to when they're all human. And to mm-hmm. be fair, his character design as a human is really cool. He's really creepy looking, but he's still clearly talented. Like, if he was really egotistical and he wasn't a great organ player and he then got better, 
when he became an organ. I could maybe understand that, but there's nothing there at all. I get a sense, Marie, you've got two ticks here. Excellent. <laughs> so, so, so you've got two out of three so far. The next grievance is I hate the new characters. Well, one of the two new characters. I hated, sorry, I hated Fife, the piccolo. Yeah, tick, um, tick, tick. I also hated Tim Curry's one because I was like, oh, I love Tim Curry's voice. He's doing a lot for the character, but like, you make no sense to me. Your powers make no sense to me. See, if it wasn't um, Tim Curry voice in it, I don't think I'd like him at all. And that's not good. That's not a good sign. Yeah, and then the the Jewish axe was just an interesting twist. I forgot about that. He's like, what's all this sugar now stuff here? And I'm like, why is he Jewish? He, 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 is, he is even more of a caricature. We talked about Big Mama on in Fox and the Hound, I think, wasn't it Big Mama? Mm-hmm. Yeah, when we kind of go something that ventures really dangerously into just sheer caricature it's it's weird i because I, I don't think it, it's um oh i can't remember the name of the famous jewish comedian uh oh not mason mel, mel brooks no mel not brooks. mel brooks there's another one who's he's the voice he's the dad crusty's dad in the simpsons oh yeah no he, he, what's his name uh, it's something oh, that's mason it's something Mason. But That's well, all. as soon as you say Krusty's dad, everyone's going to know who we're talking yeah. about. You hope, anyway, because nobody knows who I talk about when I talk about the girl in the <laughs> flake ad. And the Simpsons were on before them. So, <laughs> anyway, that's my small hill I'm prepared to die on. But it, I don't know if it's him that's doing the voice, but it sounds like someone trying to do an impersonation of him. And it's very kind of like, this is the 90s? This is kind of like... 80s kind of it's like the big heavy kind of eyebrows and stuff oh he's your my and all that kind of stuff yeah I, you've got a tick you're doing well right yeah yeah, yeah. Ding, keep ding, it going ding. what about I, did you did you like is it angelique the, the the castle decorator i didn't mind her but my problem was is that like you see so little of her and also like it's i can't remember the name of the singer no but she's an incredibly famous broadway singer and, and this is what you got her to do what a like, Bernadette, wasted role. Bernadette, Bernadette Peters. Peters. Yeah. And I was like, this is this is an incredibly wonderful singer. And yeah, this is this is what we're gonna do with her. Um so I just I was like, she's just inconsequential for the most part. Yeah, and, and let's be honest, I don't think I'd want to work at that castle because Lumiere gets about. Oh my <laughs> such a perv. Oh my word! When you're, when you're younger, it's like, oh, look at him, he's being funny. Whereas now, it's like, Ugh. no, no, no oh, means no. Or, you know, so bad. Oh, I, I'm giving you. I'm gonna give you a a tick just because the is the, oh, what's the name of the the pickly character? Or what they call? Oh, oh, he's so he, annoying. He annoyed my head. And I was just like, you know what, mate? Yeah, you're you're not for me, son. So you've got you've got a tick from you've got a tick for me, Maria. Can I? I know we're going through negatives here. Right? I feel I need to interject at some point, right? Because we will come back to Maria's negatives. We were what about four, <laughs> four? Kind of we're four through five three. Is that now? I'm not sure. You've got something. You've got, some, I think about five three. Yeah. You've you've got five. You've got four out of five. So I think it's. We can see what way this is going. Between you know, I feel that unless Brown is going to come up with a stirring defense of this film, I don't know. Do you know what? I, I will throw up my hand up. This film taught me about what it is to have a Yule log. I never knew that. Yeah, I was so surprised. And, and it's she quite was like, a sweet... Oh, there's, there's a Yule log. I was like, oh, it's... Because when I think of Yule log, I think of like the m and like, chocolate cake <laughs> Yule log. So I was like, oh, this is an actual thing that people do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I never knew that this lovely idea that it's, you know, a, a little a little thing you bring in and you bring it in, everybody places their Christmas wish and then on Christmas night you burn it and you burn all their dreams and wishes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> how, how wonderful, you know. I, th- I think everybody's just been 
you know, maybe if people would stop burning your logs, the world would be a happier place. Stop burning and, and, and burning our dreams away. But no, yes, I, I jest. I thought that was quite lovely. And I Googled it. And uh, Google says that apparently it's true. Brian, we've heard a lot of Maria's negativity towards this film. Are you going to try? What Are you going to kind of counterbalance here with some positive, positive mental vibes for... Beauty and the Beast Enchanted Christmas. I'd like to, but it, it is hard. I, I did like that they like they, they maintain Belle's character. They don't change her. She is still very headstrong. And even when the Beast is like, no Christmas, I forbid it. And then when she sees how upset Chip is, she's like, nah, fuck him. We're going to do it anyway. Like that that's Belle. She does what she thinks is the right thing to do. And I appreciate that they kept that. Yeah, it's not like Mulan 2. No. <laughs> It's not like Mulan 2 where it's like, hang on, this is not one thing to do. It's pretty much a different character. It's a different woman we're seeing in this as opposed to what we saw in the first one. Uh, I mean, I'm just going to throw in a positive vibe as well that, you know, when you compare to Return of Jafar in Aladdin 2 where we lost Robin Williams from the voice casting and then we had um, Homer Simpson. Oh, what do you call that? Dan Castanella. Yes, taking over the voice of Genie. At least we don't get that. I think largely, pretty much all the casting, apart from Chip, because the actor that played him, I think his voice had broke. And there's <laughs> one, and then there's another. I think it's an actress who'd sadly passed away. So most of the cast are back. And I look. I have talked yeah, about right this enough. before. I've talked about this before. I mean, when voices change on things, is this the Kermit issue again? Yep. It is the Kermit issue. I knew you were going to... I was going to come up. <laughs> it's the Kermit issue. It's like, you're not Kermit. And look, the last time we were talking a little bit about uh, the Muppets Haunted Mansion, I thought it was great. I loved it. But it was just a case of, you're, you're not Kermit. You, that's not the voice. But it, it happened. Like, I mean, again, it's it's another thing. It's like an animated... Like I know an animated series I've talked about. The Ghostbusters animation from years ago... They changed the voice actors and that. Now I know it's because one of the actors passed away, and it's just a thing for me. It's like when things show up, and it's like a different. I'm. It's just my weird thing, and uh, I guess if there was kids into this type of thing, and were like me at the time, it's oh, it's all the same voices. It feels right. So yeah. there we go. I, look, it's the best I could scrunch together for positive so far. We've got a Yule log about all our Christmas dreams being burnt, and we have just all the voice cast. So that's that's the most positives we've come out with so far. So Maria, we're back to you. I think <laughs> I, I I don't know. Maybe these ones are just going to be really piffy, and we're not going to let them through. Well, I'll give I'll give one bit of positivity to the to the film. You know what? What did make me laugh was the line where he like tried to say can't fall in love if they're dead, <laughs> which I so true. Dramatic. They can't fall in love if they're dead. Like, All right. Great. I was like, this is high <laughs> camp. I love it. Like, really, oh, I really God. enjoyed that line. And um, so I'll, I'll 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 put a little bit of positivity <laughs> in as well. Okay. Yeah. 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 See, just before we move on from this, I was because I was mm-hmm. curious, like. Because you used to haven't seen it, I was like, hmm, I wonder what like other people's opinions of this are. So I went on online stupidly to look at like reviews. The amount of parents that were like, this is disgusting, it's scary, the organ is nightmare fuel. Someone said the producer needs therapy. <laughs> the, the, the one that got me was, this film is more scary than Mary, and I just started laughing. <laughs> oh. Like, these people, like, like it's it's not good, but it's not the most traumatising thing you've ever seen. Like, it's not that bad. It's not It's not the opening of Bambi. Or it's not Bambi. It's not Lion King. No? It's, no. Yeah. I thought it was being a tad over dramatic, but when Maria said about the whole him saying they can't fall in love with their dead, like, so many <laughs> parents had an issue with that, and it's like, this is Disney. Like, there's dead parents, like, in every bloody film. Like, why is this suddenly an issue? <laughs> Yeah. I think I have to admit, really surprises me because the one thing about the film, I was like, I can't imagine this offending, like or like being of any kind of contention because yeah. like, it's such a, it's a very vanilla film. Like, there's nothing yeah. here that should really be causing any kind of consternation. No, like you're not going to see it in a bustle article of like 
top 10 weird Disney moments that you miss. <laughs> like, it's not it's not going to stand out. Yeah, it's... There's nothing here. I mean, I think there's other films we've talked about in the past that are better gateway drugs into Disney. But I think if you've watched Beauty and the Beast, you could be pretty safe to kind of... There you go, kids. There's I'm going to plonk this on the VHS. Mum and Daddy are going to go and have a little glass of wine, some cheese next door. You sit in there and watch that and don't come out for two hours. You know, so there we go. I uh, Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything watching this. There's nothing I can see, really. But then I'm not a parent. So maybe, maybe it is scarier than Mary. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I need to know Mary. Which Mary are we talking about here? You know. No, like Mary is in like Christmas. Oh, so it's okay. it's more scary than ah, it is see, Mary. Ah, well, I thought yeah. you were just talking about. She was just talking about a general Mary. I that also. Maybe <laughs> He's Mary. <laughs> this is like a Frozen two where Olaf's like Samantha, Mary. <laughs> I should have said Mary. That's how my partner pronounces it because he's from Belfast. Mary. Mar- Mary, hi. Merry Christmas, mate. <laughs> Merry. Merry it's Christmas. Not know the Irish listeners. <laughs> Merry Christmas and a happy new year, you big ballocks. Things like that. <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah. So we've just to clarify, we have now secured the knowledge that it is not scarier than Mary. So, Mary, if you're listening, it's not scarier than you. It's <laughs> Mary. It's Mary. So there we go. Um, it's not scary. Hello. Just to throw, I'm going to throw a bit of negativity in here. I know we've already talked about the stereotypical acts. How shit are they? I mean, I love Belle. I, I, I quite like Belle as a as a heroine, but how shit are the not one but two Christmas trees she picks out? And she's like, yes, we will go and get a glorious Christmas tree. And if I'm sorry, if that was going to be what I was going to say, right, this is going to be the Christmas tree that is going to make Beast fall in love with Christmas all over again. And it's this thing. It's this thing that looks <laughs> half dead. It's like three. You like, I mean, you think of all those baubles that are in the house. You're going to get, like, two of them on? I don't know. It's just, like, really? And, like, they're okay, I know uh, later on, spoiler, they do go into the forest. But they don't even need to go that deep into the forest to get a better tree than what they've got. They literally need to go, like... Get you to the outskirts, and they're yeah. they're fine. <laughs> yeah, it's like... On the drive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, like, why bother going all that far? You could just literally get it. It's it, This goes in the small hills I'm prepared to die on. <laughs> but it is. It's just, like... Come on, Belle. You are an educated, well-read, independent woman, but yes, queen. Yes, queen. But you, you would be the worst. Like, if she brought me home that Christmas tree. I mean, I love. I we have two Christmas trees in our house. We have the Christmas tree that I'm not allowed to touch. That's only the Christmas tree my wife has, and that's the good Christmas tree. <laughs> And I have the Tapmas tree, which is my tree, which I'm allowed to put like diehard stuff on. And I'm allowed to put like elf memorabilia on and other bits and bobs. That's a Tapmas tree. If Belle came round a knocking and was like, Jim, I've got your tree this year. Oh, bro, let's see it. And she presented the tree she brought me in that she was going to bring home in that. <sighs> like, I know Chips never experienced Christmas before, but. You're doing a shit disservice to that young boy if that's the Christmas tree you're going to serve him up for the first year. I'm sorry. It was just, it's like the fact that she looks at one tree and you're like, Chip picks the first one. And he's like, oh, I love this tree, Belle. Can we have that one? And I was waiting for her to go, oh, it's a bit shit, Chip. Let's get something else. And then she makes an excuse. She goes, oh, maybe we can get a better one. And maybe it's the animation because the animation quality because it's not that different it's just slightly bigger and you're like you went from that refusing that to this equally shit unimpressive tree i'm i'm sorry but you know bell bell you you have went down in my estimation of as as a disney princess sorry <laughs> and let's more. change your entire opinion of bell just her shitty tree choices <laughs> come on come on brian that is not it, one it but is, two shit bad. trees and this is fair, meant- like Chip does imagine the tree and he puts like in his imagination he puts one bobble on it and then it just kind of flops to the side. It's like no Chip's got a point. 
No. I mean, if that's what you're going to say, not only are you trying to impress Chip, but Beast into yeah. loving Christmas. No. <laughs> no. Like, you could go to Poundland and get a nicer tree. Yes, Belle could go to Poundland in 17th century France. I'm sure there was a, a nice. I'm sure there was a Poundland tree. equivalent. Le Poundland. I'm sure there's something <laughs> like that, you know. Probably thing gassed on, you know, things like that might be on a kind of hard times and just being like, here we go, welcome to my pent land. You would like my Christmas tree. And you'd be like, yeah, it's better than the shit that she was going to bring in. I'm sorry, but, you know, it could be. It, no, I'm not going down this ranty McRant, but I, that really bugged me that not once but twice did she offer that small child a really shit Christmas tree that. And, and like I've talked about this in the past. I mean, I am the person who will never. I'm, 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 in my typical way, I'm going to get deep, but not. I will never like. I don't know how to put this. If someone has a really terrible Christmas tree in their house, but if that brings them joy and happiness, and that's their tree and that thing, I will not begrudge anybody that because that's that's bringing them happiness, but. Even that is better than this shit tree that Belle was going to bring in. But anyway, sorry. I went off on a little mini rant there about Christmas trees. Sorry. So, Maria, so I added a negative. So we've now got 10 negatives. Unless you have Christmas tree choice. The beautiful thing is I have written down stupid tree scene. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right. Brilliant. It's, it's right there. Just Belle and the stupid tree scene. Maria, I I'm go- so angry. Maria, I'm going to let you into a spoiler. I'm going to give you a tick for that. When <laughs> I'm going to give you. Brian might go and go all these deeper meaningful re- meanings, but no, I, you've got a tick from me. Yeah, I, I have to give you a tick. I, I can't defend those awful trees. And the longer it went on, the more I was like, the humor's gone. Any and all yes. humor is gone. It just it dragged on way longer than it needed to, and it was just. That that's this film's problem. There's too many songs and there's too many scenes that just drag because there isn't a massive plot, so they have to pad it out. Like if it was funny, I wouldn't mind. Like in the original film, you've got the banter between Lumiere and Cogsworth. You don't really get that here either, but there's no banter between anyone. It's just really dragged out for no reason. Yeah. So yeah. So stupid Christmas trees. Yep. <laughs> Uh, so Maria, what else have we got in your list of negatives? Beast is horrible. He's just horrible the whole way through the film. I was like, Do you know what? You, like, I, I've been bad for you at some points, but you've, you're really like every time he just has he just wrecks the place, and he just shouts at people. And like, there's scenes where like there's one where like they fall into the snow, and like, oh, she's like, oh, the snow angel, and he's like. It's a monster. And I just, I started laughing because I was like, this is so <laughs> hammy. Like, it's so hammed up. This, like, this whole, I get that this is the part of the film. This midquel is in the part of the film where, like, they're, you know, he's not, like, he's, they, and, no, sorry, 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 yeah. they've not fallen in love yet. You know, like, he's not becoming a better person just yet. But, like, I just, I find, like, it was really, like, emo kids angry about everything i'm gonna go listen to my moody organ music yes <laughs> it was so like i hate the world it was like it was trying to be really deep and it just wasn't it was so cringy the performance and the delivery is so hammy and it's not even like like a pantomime where you can get into like the campiness of it it was just bad yeah you kind of expected beast to be going off and kind of saying all right kind of I'm, i've had enough of my organ tunes for tonight i'm gonna to play some my chemical romance because um, he even says music's the only thing that helps and i was like oh my god oh, are you on, 14? No. oh i i didn't hate him because i think you have to put it into context that it's it's a it's kind of an elongated stretched out point from that's kind of not it's kind of starts as a sequel finishes a sequel but arcs back to kind of a midpoint within the original film and he is a dick, but I think at the same time, I can... Okay, he's a total dick with the tech before he's turned into the beast. As we've already mentioned, he is the most obnoxious child 
I've a child, teenager, I'm not quite certain. Because I think in the, the live action version, Maria's going to know this straight away, six times of viewing it. <laughs> but, sorry, I've watched West Side Story, so that's why I'm all about clicking my <laughs> fingers. But he's, I think it's Dan Stevens is an adult in the live action version. But when he's, when he's turned, he's not young like he is here. So the young beast is definitely 100% bona fide. Let me just stamp that there. He's a dick. I don't find the older beast. I think he has dicky moments, but there's times I think he's frustrated by himself. Like the ice skating sequence, you you can see that he's someone that is frustrated. In the fact, you're going to be a bit frustrated when you're like a handsome-ish kind of kid, I suppose, and now you're a big beast. But I, I don't know. Like I the. The, the angel, but I mean, I the snow angel and the monster. I I didn't find that being dick. I just like he's going. He thinks of himself at this point in the story as a monster. So why would he not act as a monster? And it's only three because, as I say, it's it's a midpoint. It's a very small point of the film. You know, you can see that this is the beginning of Bell's influence on him, and to realize, beast. Stop being such a such such a dick, and also get down to Lipunland for next year, and don't let Belle pick the Christmas tree. You pick the Christmas tree. No, that I, that's I, a fair point. Yeah. No, I, I'd agree. Like it's it is that. I think the thing is, is that when watching this, it is a point where the beast has like there's none of the humor and the warmth that makes you like the character in either the 1991 film or the remake, the live action. And yeah, you make a really good point. Like this is him at his most brooding and moody, and you know, I think that was the problem. Was it's like it's like he picked like the worst point of the character. Well, um, you're not like, gonna get. You're not gonna. Sorry, you're not gonna get this beast at any point bursting into song with a bit of evermore. You're you that. You're not gonna see that. See Maria. <laughs> you know that's us. But I I just look at that as being. They have to play up his character as being much more moody, much more aggressive for it to really kind of fit in with everything. Because, you know, this is this is probably being seen and heralded as the turning point that which is probably in the it's been a long time since I've seen the original animation. It because I can't remember what the turning point in the animation is. He saves her. She tries to get away. I'm, I'm, I'm judging this having seen the live action version more recently than the animation but that's the turning point when he saves her isn't it from the wolves yeah yeah because he saves her from the wolves and then he gets injured and she kind of nurses him back to health kind of thing yeah so he was motivated by this beautiful christmas to to be the one do you know what she is worth saving even that annoyed me like that that's such a big pivotal moment for the character development and the plot development in the original film and then in this they just have a watered a literally watered down version where she goes out to get a better Christmas tree but then falls through the ice and he then responds by locking her in the dungeon like I was watching it like none of this makes sense although that that scene did used to scare me as a kid when the tree like wraps itself around her leg when she's in the water and it starts dragging her down and poor Chip's trying to pull her up that yeah. used to freak me out as a kid yeah, coming back to what we were saying earlier on, where we thought this was quite safe. When you mention it, I mean, that sequence is definitely more scary than not Mary. Mary, if you're listening, not Mary. <laughs> Mary, it's definitely more scary than Mary. That particular sequence is of probably the animated actions. I think that's probably the best sequence. And I, I know my, my lovely wife, she wasn't, she didn't dislike it. She wasn't charmed by it, coming back to me, similar vein to myself, where she. Like we both find it charming, but we weren't charmed by it. I mean, I know she quite liked the sequence where I, the opposite of me, when they come down to the tower and they have all the plates and Chip sees a Christmas tree, but it's just all the shit of the house just basically turned into a Christmas tree. He's never named Christmas. He's not going to know any better. I'm sure, she's going to give him a shit Christmas tree anyway. But, um, sorry, I should let this go. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I don't know. We, we both find this fine and it it did the thing, I don't know about either of you, where we've talked about this before, we talked about with Fox and the Hound, where I quite easily watched that film over two sittings. I watched it in one sitting because I knew it was only an hour and 12 minutes long. 
but a couple of times I did do the old pause remote. How long's left in this? Oh, 45 minutes. Okay. How long's left? 40 minutes. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) It's like watching the clock when you're in, like, a lesson you don't like in school and it just drags. Yeah, I I did, as I said, I've mentioned this a couple of times, so no, it's what I do. I repeat myself all the time in this pod to try and be uh, hilarious, but feel horribly. I think I would have genuinely liked this had it been 25 minutes, half an hour. I'm kind of the same, because I loved it as a kid. I expected to go into this dead excited to sit and go, oh my God, is is that over already? But I was like you, I was like, okay, we're, we're half an hour and 45 minutes to go probably pause it watch an episode of Seinfeld to come back to it like I, I don't know it was it was a weird experience can I ask I'm just gonna throw I don't know maybe you'll know this Brian but was there in the same way there was an Aladdin TV series was there a Beauty and the Beast TV series I don't think so there is another Beauty and the Beast film it's like Belle's magical world or something but I've never seen it so I don't know what the plot of that is, but I don't think there was a TV series. I hope it's not an involving trees. That's all I'm <laughs> going to say. It's not her magical world of trees. I might. I'm sorry. I might, Bill. <laughs> is but is this one that's potentially like I know you've been a big defender of Aladdin three, isn't it? Arabian Nights or Prince of um, Thieves? Prince of Thieves. Prince of Thieves. I know you're a big defender of that Aladdin movie. But uh, no one can defend Return of Jafar. Nobody can. You know, I I think this is better. Like, I mean, in comparative things, like I suppose we should start to bring things to a close unless Maria still has more negatives to get through. (laughs) No, I think if we compare this to something like Return of Jafar, I think this is definitely better than that. Yeah. And I'm not, I don't, I think Return of Jafar is on Disney Plus. I think it is. It probably is. I just know, I mean, there, if you look in terms of a, a film where you see two animation styles, I mean, the animation in it is horrible. Yeah, horrible. Uh, it's it's so bad. And I think Aladdin's even more white. They they whiten his character up much more in in the in the sequel than they do in the, the original. I think it's it's better than that. This is better than that, I think. But I think I would maybe watch Return of Jafar again, just because I know it's so terrible and because I know it's so bad. <laughs> and I, you talk about yourself, Victoria, been looking back and loving something. I remember getting my mum to take me. I think we might have went, had to go to Woolworths and Lisburn, from Oma to Lisburn, to get our hands on Return of Jafar because I was just obsessed with Aladdin when I was younger and loving it and had no shame. It's only when I went back and rewatched it a couple of years ago and went, this is bad. Like, this is really bad. But um, that's a discussion for a podcast another day. I don't know, but you, yourselves, I mean, I don't, I know we've had, we've discussed in a previous pod many moons ago, Milan 2, which I had never seen and I only watched after watching Milan. I think it's terrible. It's really bad. It's really bad. I mean, I don't know where you feel in terms of those kind of straight to DVD, straight to Disney TV sequels. I know this isn't technically a sequel. It's kind of, it's kind of like, it's not really The Godfather 2. It's not like a sequel and a prequel going on at the same time. It's kind of just its own thing. Where do you both think it rates in terms of that, of the studio's straight to DVD stuff? I'd Honestly, I'd rank it quite low. Like if, if you'd asked me before, before I'd watched it again, I would probably put it way higher. But now that I've rewatched it, I'm like, there's no plot. The songs are bad. The animation's bad. It's not. Memorable. Don't let Maria. Don't let Maria sway uh, you. You know. No, you... no. She honestly, she has like the, the more <laughs> I think about it, the more annoyed I get because there are some like sequels that aren't bad. Like the second Lilo and Stitch, I love. The second Pocahontas, I really, really like. The second um, Little Mermaid, Cinderella. There's a load of them that are actually quite good. And this is just bad. I did not know all those films had sequels. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, d- I did not know that. But again, I don't think I've ever seen Pocahontas either. I'm nearly certain. I don't think I've seen Pocahontas. It's not up there. I mean, I was more into Atlantis at that time. and Because it had Michael J. Fox. I respect on- that. 
underrated Disney movie. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I think it's. I would still say it's it's higher than Return of Jafar. I think it's higher than Mulan two because those are the only ones I can think of that I have seen. Oh, do you know what's good? Lady and the Tramps 2. Lady and the Tramp 2 is good. Scamp's Big Adventure. It's like they're, I think they have, obviously Lady and Tramp have like a litter and they've only one boy and he's called Scamp and he goes off on this like little London adventure with like all these, I think they're like dogs that are part of like a a freak show or a circus or something, but it's quite good. Okay, another one I'll throw in. I think that this is, well, I don't know. I think it's just because it's so inoffensive. Fox and the Hound 2, because we talked about that on the last pod. I mean, again, Fox and the Hound 2 has nothing to do, really, other than reusing the, the same yeah. two characters from... Uh, oh! Go for it. La- Lion King 2. That, like, I... Me, me and my sisters were never traumatised by Mufasa's death because we saw the second one first. We we knew Zera and Kovu before we knew Scar and Mufasa. Lion, Lion King 2 is, is up there. Okay, I'm intrigued by Maria's reaction, though, to what you said, so I don't know if that's going to be <laughs> I agree with you completely or I disagree with you completely. Do you tell? I think, I think there is. There's what, I can't remember, because I think there's two sequels to The Lion King. And there's one there's, of the There's Lion I King, remember. like, 1, 1. 1.5 or something, and it oh. kind of does what this one does, and it goes back to, like, the middle of part of the story of the first film, because it's Simone and Pumbaa, isn't it? I think so, yeah. There's there's one of the Lion King sequels that I do remember as a kid really, really liking. Um, and similarly, like, uh, like it, I think the problem is, is that it's been so long since I've seen some of them that I think I actually need to watch them again. Yeah. It's like, I think I saw the Aladdin sequels maybe once because we didn't like them. We only, we only watched the, the first one over and over again. Um, and yeah, it's the same with like, I remember actually getting Mulan 2 on DVD and being so upset. I was like, this is, this, how could you do this to me, my poor boy, you know? <laughs> like, I was, I, I remember being really mad about it. Um, but again, I, but I think it's probably so many of them are quite forgettable. Like, I think, I, I think I remember getting gifted the sequels quite a lot as a kid, but I can't tell you what most of them are about because it's been so long since I've watched them. Yeah, I think I I know I definitely got the third Aladdin as a gift because everyone knew I was obsessed with Aladdin, and I just can't remember. I don't know you've talked about it and we've talked about it, Brian, in previous pods. I never got round to rewatching it. Do you? Th- and I don't really know. It's probably not a fair question. Do you think Disney have got better at that now? Kind of where we look at what that kind of those. I suppose we haven't really had that many sequels recently and i know it's kind of now it's went from kind of let's do a straight to dv sequel to let's just do a live action remake i suppose and now you're going to have numerous sequels to that i know we're getting aladdin 2 we're getting cruella 2 they clearly now know they can milk those cash cows but i don't know where we rate i mean 97 we've had return to jafar do do you feel or not return to return off jafar do, do you think they got better they obviously do, Brian, because you're saying you, you, there's quite a few you like. Like, what is it about those that you like as opposed to um, these? I think partly the animation's better. I don't know. Like, it's not... Their, their sequels, their animation isn't as good as the original features, but the animation and the ones that I remember are better than The Enchanted Christmas. Um, Lion King 2, I thought it had a really great score. It was really dark. It was... Like, I find Kiara and Kovu really, like, relatable. For some, I'm Kovu, like, I don't know why I have a crush on a lion, but I do. So I'm, I'm hoping someone will resonate with that. Maria's nodding, so. <laughs> All good. Cinder- Cinderella, too, is interesting because it's about Cinderella, like, adjusting to being royalty, which you, you never see that part of the fairy tale. Like, it ends once they're married, but that would be weird, being poor and then all of a sudden having all these responsibilities. And it gives more depth to, I want to say Drusilla. It's one of her stepsisters. She kind of has this huge character arc where she realizes she treated Cinderella really badly and she herself falls in love and becomes a much better person. That was really interesting. And then Pocahontas too goes into, because obviously one of the biggest criticisms of Pocahontas is that it's not historically accurate. And it's like, it's a Disney cartoon. 
But the second one kind of addresses that because it brings in John Rolfe, who the original, like the actual real Pocahontas married. So it kind of brings in what Pocahontas, the real life historical figure, went through. Like it, it it's more as stupidly it sounds, it's more historically accurate than the first one. And it's about her like going to England and having to be this like quote unquote noble savage, and it brings a lot of the themes to the forefront again. Okay. But when you say the thing about what one of the good things about Beauty and the Beast is they bring all the voice actors back. They don't bring Mel Gibson back for John Smith. And I don't know who they got to voice him, but it's so jarring. Like even as a kid I noticed it. So that's so, my only criticism of that film. Hang on, hang on just one second, right? What? <laughs> so I raised this issue with Kermit the Frog and you're like, Jim <laughs> Get over it. Mel Gibson doesn't come back for Pocahontas 2 and you're like, stop everything. Is is this Victoria Begr- is this Victoria Double O'Brien the hypocrite? I can't really call you Double O'Brien because you now have you now have your, your cameras on when we record these pods because those the Double O'Brien was just because you were an international woman of mystery. But is yeah, you this blew my cover. Yeah, is it is this is this Brian being a tad bit of a hypocrite, possibly? I don't know. I think so. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. Double standard. Sure does. I think it's because Kermit's voice never bothered me, but John Smith's voice does. So now I'm like, no, Jim's got a point. <laughs> there we go. I'll just always win. I'm happy to play the long game to win my arguments. So, yeah, I mean, I know it's, we're, we are kind of... Well, I've got one last question I suppose we'll ask, and I know we might want to keep those for if we decide to do future christmasy themed editions of we need to talk about disney but maria just for you i mean we've talked about a lot of the the animated sequels the straight to dvd sequels you know do you think like victoria that they apart from the lack of mel gibson do you think that they got better it's hard to say to be honest you know i'm um, like i think disney has gotten a lot better with how they especially like newer ones like i, I remember hearing about the triangle tv series and people really liked it because I think that's what they did was after this point, they changed from doing the breath to videos and they made it instead that they were going to make them into um, TV shows. Like uh, the Emperor's New Groove had a TV show that ran for like three seasons. It was oh, really that was popular. brilliant. Yeah. And like, I feel like there was one for Hercules as well, which was also yeah. very popular. Yeah. Um, so I think the thing was certainly like they, they either they did the movie and then they did the direct sequel like Atlantis or they were like, we're going to try a TV show. And I think that it just, they changed tack. And I think that was more successful because, you know, like now, Tangled, I remember hearing a lot about its sequel because people really liked it. Um, I have to the, admit... The Princess and the Frog's got one coming out as well, doesn't mm-hmm. it? Right, yeah. yeah. I remember I when think- Disney did their whole big Marvel release thing, they had mentioned a couple of, like, the Disney things. And I remember Tiana. Like, I think that's the title of the show. I remember that coming up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, they are, I suppose that's kind of the comparative, because now that we have a platform like Disney+, Plus, which essentially is just a, a bigger budget, bigger version of the Disney TV channel from back in the day, I mean, they have a lot of stuff, like, I mean, I was telling you, I know it's unrelated, and it is Christmassy esque but we have, like, the Olaf shorts, which, if you haven't watched, if you need a little pick-me-up, if you genuinely need a little pick-me-up... I I put it on, and I've, I'll be honest, there's a few I've watched a few times. I think The Little Mermaid is probably my favourite of those little, of Olaf reenacting Disney movies. I think there's The Lion King, there's definitely, there's Lion King, there's The Little Mermaid I've watched a couple of times. I can't remember the rest of them, but if you if you have Disney Plus and other streaming services are available, just Olaf shorts are not available on anything other than Disney Plus. <laughs> I would recommend if you are looking for something, and we talk about like gateway drugs for Disney and things like that. You, it's it is genuinely something I think you can sit down and watch as a family, and I, th- I suppose that's something you want to do around Christmas. Would I suggest sitting down to watch Disney's Enchant or Beauty and the Beast, uh, an Enchanted Christmas? I you could. I think a few people might nod off or might look at their phones within five ten minutes of it putting on. But yeah, I think Disney have got but I mean another one I love, I know it's not Christmassy at all, but Doug Days. I don't know if either of you've watched I mean Doug Days with, with Doug from uh, Up. The dog from Up. It's Wonderful. it's I I've watched that and 
no matter how many times that dog says squirrel, I will always laugh. Always, 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 always laugh. And there's just there's an episode I think with puppies, and it's just it's lovely. It's 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 warm. It's warm hugs. It's it's kind of what Disney do. And I know that's technically venturing into to Pixar, I suppose, but there. But I I think that kind of rambly typical Jim McLean way. I think the TV series. I think Maria might be the way we will see Disney want to expand. I, I don't know. I, I've kind of went off on a rambly tangent. But yes, watch Olaf, the the shorts, because if you don't, you know, if you if you just genuinely, it's up there. Like I'm going to say, I've, I'm always kind of saying around this time of year, but I prescribe It's a Wonderful Life. I will now add to that Olaf's Christmas, sh- or Olaf's shorts. I, I, I think that's just what they're called. I'm not quite certain. But, because um, you hadn't seen it, but you hadn't heard about it, Brian, until I suggested watching it. Someone told no. me about it. Someone told me about it, and I think we watched. We actually watched them twice through when we watched them because they're that short. They're only like two, three minutes each. They're they're very short if you haven't watched them. But look, we are going to bring this pod to because I fear we are now. This podcast is now longer than <laughs> the film we are talking about. But I know we might want to keep these, and these are films we can always revisit. Do either of you have? I know you've mentioned a few already, Brian. But anything else Christmassy in Disney, either of you would suggest anyone seek out this Christmas that might be available on Disney Plus. You might find in DVD, you might pick up on VHS if you still have a VHS player knocking about. You know, is there is there anything there you would suggest seeking out? Always, always, always recommend Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas. And not just because it's my friend Becca's favourite. It's just, it's so wholesome and Christmassy and fun and again it's it's not that long so if you have an hour to kill you can just find disney plus and that'll do you it'll give you a wee smile okay maria anything you want to fire out it's not it's not christmasy but i really like like um the disney shorts like you were saying like there's a wonderful one that's like a little bird and it's them on the sand it's gorgeous there's there's another one they have which is um it's about two older people and they're kind of like reliving their youth and it's really yes. dancing in the street. Like it's, I, I can't remember the name of it again, which is terrible. But like, I do, I do really like their, like their shorts. I think they're just wonderful because it's so easy at Christmas. You kind of get bogged down watching a lot of films and stuff. Whereas when you can put on something that's short and sweet, like I hadn't heard of the Olaf shorts, and I'm now obsessed with the King Triton. Uh, you know, like the, <laughs> that rent free. It lives rent free. Um, always now um yeah i think i think for me though i love watching there's a couple of disney films i just like watching it's just like tangled and stuff yeah and around christmas time we're going to have enchanto i think 24th of mm-hmm. december i think it's going to go on to disney plus because last year their little christmas gift was soul i think mm-hmm. either new year's day or christmas day i can't quite remember mm-hmm. um i've missed enchanto i just have well it's still in cinemas i just haven't had a chance i've just been busy doing other bits and bobs I think I fear I might miss the big screen experience for that and just watch it at home on Christmas over Christmas uh, with my lovely wife and my mum when we're all here just hopefully kind of just in a mini food coma and you know just uh, refusing to move and just finding the Disney channel and or Disney pl- putting on Disney plus and that's us for the afternoon uh, I can't really add I know at some point Frozen will get watched I just gonna say I <laughs> Because it's not Christmassy in any way other than the fact there's some snow and there's some ice and there's a snowman in it. That's it. And I've already, I'm, you know, I've already mentioned Olaf shorts, but uh, yeah, you know, and we, I know it's not animated, but Disney and I own the Muppets. And if you want to hear the Muppets with a proper sound in Kermit, uh, yeah, seek out a Muppets Christmas Carol because it's our generations. It's a wonderful life. It will make you be a better person and you will... If you have never watched it before and you don't leave that film, you're talking about things living in your head rent free. But one more sleep till Christmas. It's it it that that lives in my head rent free in March. You know, you know that that's the way I love that film. But anyway, I I feel this is a rambly kind of little outro. So I think we've been lukewarm about. Well, no, I don't actually think we've been lukewarm. I I think we've pretty much we, we hated this. I think as much as Brown's childhood memories and rose tinted glasses. We didn't enjoy this, so if you've got this far, and if you're a parent and you you really dislike your child, maybe put that on for them over Christmas. But I would not recommend seeking this out. I don't think Victoria would recommend seeking out Beauty and the Beast and Chant at Christmas. Maybe just watch Beauty and the Beast. 
Instead. Yeah, it's a far yep. better recommendation. I really don't think Maria, with her long list, would definitely <laughs> will will definitely not let recommend. Uh, I think. Would you even wish it upon your worst enemy, Maria? I think I would recommend it to somebody for a laugh and then see the reaction. <laughs> So what I want you to do, Maria, and if that person's listening to this podcast, I apologize. Between now and Christmas, I want you to recommend that to someone. And I want you to let us know what their feedback is. Well done. And, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and we will find out what that person comes back and says. Maybe they'll love it, and then you'll have all lost all respect for them. Lost so, a friend. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> They're dead to you. Anyway, this is a rambly little thing. So this has been a lot of fun. This has been our little Christmassy edition of We Need to Talk About Disney. We will be back. We are planning in January to kind of get back into the podcasting kind of game and get podcasting regularly. Famous words I've said before. But uh, our TV show is going to be off for a few months. So it means I can kind of refocus and rejig towards the podcast. So if you've missed We Need to Talk About Disney, we will be back in January talking about Victoria the Black Cauldron, I believe. Yes. Okay. I, I I'm not looking forward to that, but No, you I'm know, not either. <laughs> you know, I, I I don't know if Strong we'll be as, I don't know if we'll be as positive. I don't know. I, I think we might be more positive about Beauty and the Beast and Enchanted Christmas than the Black Cauldron. I don't know. You'll have to wait, dear listeners, till January for that podcast. So that's really enough of me in this little rambly outro. All that's left for me to do is thank uh, my partner in crime, my co-host for this podcast, the lovely Victoria Brown. Thank you, Jim. And guesting on this pod, the lovely Maria McQuillan. Thank you so much for having me back. Absolute pleasure. So with that, have a happy Christmas and enjoy some of the other festive editions off our little podcast i know the sleuth sisters joe and therese have their little festive edition of crime scene to screen and you have the annual tradition that is the christmas tv listings and if the the christmas tv listings guide if you've never watched it if you've never listened to it, if you thought that this podcast had structure coherence a lack of rambliness and rambly kind of small hills prepared to die on if you, if, if, if you if you like those, the Christmas TV Listens Guide is the podcast for you as we guide you through the best of Christmas TV from Christmas Eve to New Year's Day. And we put not only Christmas TV, Christmas TV will be going ahead against streaming services and as a result of last year, online physical media available from your local point land so that is what we are going up against last year it was a three-way tie look out for that pod all these podcasts will be available on the website or wherever you get your podcast and fix so yeah that's enough from us bye This has been We Need to Talk About Movies. Thanks for listening. For more information, visit banterflix.com. See you next time.